Welcome back to the show. Today we have Dr. Kevin Fleming. He's the founder of Gray Matters International. Kevin, welcome to the show. Welcome. It's good to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back on the show. You did the radio version and, uh, you know, begin. that's kind of a longer interview of some of the stuff we're going to cover today. But sure. maybe before we get into what we're going to talk about today, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. Uh, I'm a Northeast guy. I grew up in uh, sure. Western Massachusetts. Use it. So I'm very happy currently right now with my Red Sox. That's probably going to be out of date by the time everybody sees this, but um, hanging in there with the Astros, by the way. So that's good. Um, but yeah, Western Massachusetts, uh, did my schooling at uh, Notre Dame, uh, spent uh, uh, many years there, the whole 90s there, uh, bachelor's, master's, PhD there, and then uh, went off to do a little residency, uh, postdoc at Wyoming, and then um, started my entrepreneurial work right after that, getting into some health coaching Kind of endeavors a, a, a company that did um, uh, some we hooked up with self-insured entities and helped them uh, lower down their uh, premiums for the chronically ill employees interesting uh, but yeah it was a really nice venture because it really taught me sort of that you know that bottom line piece that you know your your shrinky kind of ideas are great and all but they better lead to some serious change and the pocketbooks in in people's lives and so that kind of just was the nice a great ground floor for the launch of Gray Matters and the thinking and the philosophy behind that. Sure. So what exactly is Gray Matters and why did you actually decide to create your own thing? Yeah. So Gray Matters, I, I always kind of intro this as sort of saying it's uh, it's somewhere between two kind of paradigms of thought right now in terms of the, the assumptive base of where, what I'm doing. And on one side, you got the the clinical psychology therapy counseling kind of mental health or medical mental health model. Um, psychiatric drugs, counseling therapy, psychotherapy, things like that to help a bunch of psychological disorders. Very reasonable, good for some people some of the time in some ways, in my opinion, definitely at value. And then you have on the other side, you have the, the growing coaching field, the personal development uh, field, whether that's executive coaching, life coaching, advisors, thought leaders, business and non-business whatever whatever that entity is these are the these are to me the, those are the kind of camps out there for developing human behavior or developing human beings and changing human behavior and things like that um great matters saw i think my company saw early on sort of some half truths on both sides um and, and mainly because i wore hats on both sides right so i can kind of see what worked and what didn't um and on the clinical psych side, what, what, what I realized was very good at relationship building, communication skills, kindness, compassion, connection, uh, emotional intelligence, supposedly, but it definitely like being in a very, uh, you know, relationship driven kind of way of getting change. Um, that to me, eventually, I learned that that was a, maybe a necessary but not sufficient condition to change, right? So you could have a bunch of people coming into your office um who uh say words of change i want to change this i'm suffering i'm hurting i'd like this I'd like this to, to shift or be different um but what you'd find is they were either there they were at a different stage of change or their goal for the change process was uh what we call a first order kind of mechanism so it was more on a symptomatic reliefs without kind of radically changing their assumption it's very different to lower depressive symptoms from a first order side than the second order side. The person that comes in from a second order change perspective are looking for you to radically blow up their assumptions and to feel uncomfortable and under a little bit of distress for good reasons. And I couldn't make that assumption many times in the clinical side. And I think not, not I'm saying that's wrong, but uh, what I, I just enjoy doing more of the bolder radical dialogues of change. So the coaching profession comes along, as we know, in the past 10, 20 years or and says, um, wow, you know, gee, all you clinical guys and gals are doing a little bit too much on this pathology and negativity and what's wrong with people. There's a lot of things that are good. Let's grow the good and the strengths. Again, sounds reasonable to me. Again, uh, I think a necessary but not sufficient condition to this to the puzzle of change. And so uh, the coaching field, in my opinion, is wrought with similar kind of or different uh, uh, issues like just, you know, people not as qualified in the science piece behind human behavior. Um, some ethics, ethics issues in terms of how people uh, conceptualize a problem, whether it's an individual, a team or a corporate culture. There's a lot of times there's a lot of dysfunction and disorder there that yeah, does need a psychological lens and they can miss that a bit. 
um, in my opinion. And I think an over overdoing of motivation, right? As, as sort of just like, a, it's, an, it's a rational model of if you just kind of get motivated, know your goals, set boundaries or do whatever you need to do, you, you can achieve anything you put your mind to. That kind of model, I think, has some limitations. So Gray Matters International really kind of put those two together and said, hey, listen, let's take the best of clinical psych uh, background in terms of relationship building and understanding of human behavior. And let's put a whole nother paradigm of developmental kind of orientations of change and, and then sprinkle on top a bit of neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience and neurotechnologies and a lot of innovations that we have now that really go into irrationality of human behavior when words don't matter as much or don't seem to be uh, getting people to change. What does that mean? Does it mean we're just over here and and pathology land and need medicine? Or does it mean that we're all, as Dan Ariely would say, predictably irrational? Are there some aspects of us that are eccentric, odd, and influenced by other factors that we may, may never have access to? That's really what I love. Gray Matters International is a high performance zone, working with entrepreneurs, executives, um, distinctive clients who just don't either fit psychotherapy or the traditional model of coaching and really want best practice science to transform. And then it's also, for their spouses and their kids and their family lives and their private lives as well. No, that's interesting because I think at least in, in my case or, or kind of my thoughts on the whole thing is I don't really necessarily care which vertical it falls in. I just want you to help me with the issue that I have. Right. And right. If that needs, you know, what, whatever that needs, let's figure that out together. Right. And I think, part of the problem is being open to actually changing that behavior, right? Or because obviously it's probably really hard sometimes to get somebody to be able to say, look, this is what I want you help with and then be willing to actually work on changing that. Cause that can in itself can be kind of scary and hard to change. Right. Well, it, it, yes, and no doubt. And that's even it's scary and hard to change, even when you think you have an idea of what the it is that you have to go after. Um, but now, now take that level of self courage and kind of go it up two or three or four notches when someone puts up something that's very coveted or self protected in your psyche and your sacredness and says, No, that's actually a problem, Joe. Oh, wait, that's how I built my self esteem and, and how pe people praise me for that. Are you telling me? Now we'll see if your words, Kevin, that you just gave me are really true, right? And that's definitely the issue when you're dealing with successful people because many of the things that we have to work on are the things that they're rewarded on many times in their day to day lives. Uh, they achieved a much ego status and, um, and accolades. And so, what happens to the brain at this point is the dopaminergic reward circuitry starts coding and understanding and predicting those types of enhancing kind of things to do in your life and and you end up sort of not knowing the tipping point and you flood your brain engine so to speak with too much of dopamine and uh, the other neurotransmitters can't seem to keep up and you end up with this confusion that is really a, a big chunk of my work which is when success and happiness don't really dive anymore or even worse when they become diametrically opposed to each other. That's even more frightening for these folks who have a wonderful story success and find out that something maybe has to change deep in them to keep everything else they love supposedly as well. And it's, it's very, very challenging. Yeah. So walk me through that a little bit because it's always kind of fascinated me that even in myself, and I've done it too, is where you think if I achieve this, whatever that is, that that's will be like happy or like if I make X amount of dollars or something like that, mm -hmm. but they're not related at all really from what I've read anyway, or what I've understood to be true. No, you're correct. Actually, I think some of the, I think this research still holds and folks out there can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the, the, the relationship between uh, money and happiness and again, loosely defined in some sure. subjective experience of well being. Um, in it's a one-to-one -one correlation really only till around 50,000 a year. Wow. It's remarkable. Wow. Then the relationship gets, I think, a bit asymptotic after that, uh, levels off a bit. I don't know what, what six figure number, but it's very low six figures. It kind of starts getting a little bit, the return on your investment, so to speak, for each dollar earned gets smaller and smaller. And then there is this drop off. There's a slarp, a, a, a strong drop off where it's an inverse and it's, it's disastrous. So this, so it's really interesting to me because everything about our culture is past the one-to-one -one correlation point. Every, I mean, I think, I think most college grads start way above 50 grand. So they're already starting behind the eight ball. 
right? It's so it's very interesting to me that you kind of removing the chains and it, you know, and it's all, and it's having a, a radical effect on the brain. And there is something that behavioral economists call the hedonic treadmill, right? And so this is sort of a, a meaning the things that you were mentioning, all these things that we were, we were trained to believe are the things to happiness aren't because what ends up happening like a treadmill we keep moving and it needs to go faster and it keeps it, it, it you're never off of it so what felt like success at one point once you achieve it will not, it keeps moving it won't actually feel like that same objective parameter and we see this too with like um with kids these 20 somethings or even teenagers who are starting to kind of conceptualize the vision of their life what they're wanting i mean there was a day when i'm not how, I'm not sure how old you are but back when I'm, 35. Back when we were younger, you would hear articulations and narratives of futures being things like, you know, I want to have a certain trade or craft or learn a specialty skill. And, and even if, it was, if, even if you were, you know, white collar, smarty pantsy kind of person, you were thinking doctors, lawyers, some kind of, you know, whatever. Now what you hear is you hear a lot more of wanting to be liked. I want to have the corner office and the gold watch. I want to be a CEO. These are very interesting statements. They want things that are sort of like emotional, ancillary, protective, sort of pleasure-based things around a certain lifestyle, but they put those things that are supposed to be environmentally based in the center and then work around that. So everything's reversed, and it's in my opinion. And so you have a very challenging time trying to get identity questions answered, uh, wisdom kind of things looked at, you know, philosophy, good thinking, all these things get very challenging for a culture that has needle in the vein all the time. Yeah, it's interesting because I think even just talking to a bunch of really kind of successful people, even on the show, I think they still feel kind of lost or a fraud yeah. or, you know, like they don't belong where they are. So it, it makes sense that younger people are feeling the same way. But I, I think the thing that they're missing is there's people that have been hugely successful that feel the exact same way that are maybe 20 or 30 years older than them. Is that fair to say? Oh, yeah. No, I think uh, I'm not sure of the the thought leader who came up with the book or the phrase, but the imposter syndrome is actually a book. And it's right. And it's, it's written for these C-levels and executives who feel like someone's going to find out that they're unqualified for where they really are. And it's this chronic state of, and I see this now with a lot of my clients, it's um, just an, an internal anxiety. Now I'm not talking kind of the panic attack kind of stuff, which of course for some it is big and it is a severe a feeling. It's horrible. But there is this sort of almost like existential anxiety that seems to be an undercurrent to our world. And, it, it, and you know, and it's exacerbated by lack of sleep and boundaryless, uh, boundaryless stuff and and things like that and what happens is um it what ends you end up kind of not sleeping well you end up not having the right types of uh balancing self-care uh, issues in your life um and so you end up kind of um chronic you get used to this chronic um, restlessness and and you end up self-medicating so another key area we work on a lot is addiction or at least compulsive patterns of behavior that aren't healthy this is a big this is a big area now because, and there, I, I don't know, I don't know if I mentioned this in our radio interview, but there was a, I think a neurobiologist out of Stanford, Sapolsky is his name, wrote a great book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. <laughs> and uh, he was basically saying, you know, listen, a zebra ha is either eaten by the lion on the savanna or he runs away, you know? So that primal survival instinct of fight, flight, or freeze can kick in and it's resolved. So the switch is either on or off fairly quickly. What happens now, because of this chronic ill at ease uh, ex uh, anxiety that's sort of just a given, it's like a white noise underneath a lot of our, our, our desire to achieve at all costs, is we end up flipping that switch on and stay stuck because urgency, the idea of information that we need to process and work with and decide from is always coming at us. Well, at some point the brain just says, okay, that's, that's urgent. That's, an, that's a red alarm kind of thing. So life death situations start now getting coded in just forms of like informational urgency that stays on that switch which means cortisol dumps at the you know the hippocampus go up brain derived neurotropic factor goes down we seem to see a lot of neuro uh, neuroplastic changes because of the stress and the burnout and again all insidious it's never kind of like hey i'm a big problem in your life hi how are you could you let me into your life uh no thanks it doesn't happen that way 
you know, it's always behind something that's coveted and accepted and good and virtuous and rewarded. Yeah. And it, it's interesting how, as you progress in your career and you're growing in your career, everybody has a set of problems. Yeah. Just they're different problems, right? Even like the wealthiest person on the planet, which is probably Jeff Bezos at this point recording this, he still right. has issues, right? Like there's yeah. problems that he has, good, bad, or other. So they're just different right. problems, right? And I think people forget that, that once you attain something, well, it's just a different set of problems, is right? Correct. Well, it is. And it's because when we look at the construct of happiness, which, as you know, is such a big thing now, it's sexy to talk about happiness and study it. And even though I got to say that one of the best quotes that I've ever heard on happiness is happiness is in the waiting room of happiness. Gosh, I love that quote, because it's basically saying, let's get our cause, cause and effect parts of the, of the, var the variables in the equation correct, because you don't go after happiness to get it. And that's a big piece that's missing. But it's what you're it's what you're alluding to. The, de the definition of happiness is a relative construct, actually. It's, it's, uh, and it, and it's, it, it evolves. And we see this with like a lot of my trader clients that obviously can make a lot and lose a lot. Um, the, the remarkable effects on the brain from a mental health perspective during a, a perceived loss, even if the loss drops them from, you know, 6 million to 4.5, <laughs> we would see the 4.5 from the outside as it being enough, you know, but, but it's, per it's, per it's perceived loss right? It's, it's always in contrast. And any type of, we know this from loss aversion, we are more motivated to, to prevent the loss than necessarily to grow the gain in a long-term sustainable way. And so when you're oriented that way, um, your thinking is going to be skewed and you have to kind of be at least aware that that is the case. But now you're hitting on ego stuff and that's hard. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. I, I think that's part of the problem that you probably find a lot is like just getting somebody's ego in check, right? It's a tough one. I like to say that it's a, there are two types of clients that come my way. One is the um, sort of these clients that are just hardwired for tire kicking. Like they're just, they've gotten to a certain level and, they're, and they do get sort of psychologically naked, so to speak, very easily. And there isn't a challenge, a threat, a conversation that takes them off kilter. Um, they will go to the radical levels to you know, kick, their think, kick their thinking. That's to be honest. That's a smaller subset from a from a transformational human being subset. That 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 is. It just is. Most of the clients that will find their way through the doors of gray matters are either through the spouse because they're they there's some troubles going on at home where you know hey wait a minute it's time to look at this all of a sudden because the wife is finding out about some illicit behavior and I've got to do something or a board you know a board member can call or the or chairman of company to say hey listen we've got a very talented person who's imploding a bit we got to keep them uh help us do that there's a lot of discrete need going on here in terms of how we work with this person so let's come on in and bring your tools where we where he can do it easily you know or family business you'll have a lot of issues like that with family business but in general all these scenarios are the second camp which is oh crap it's you know blanks hit the fan uh, it's time to change. And it's, it's just a sad part of humanity. Pain is a big motivator. Um, it's just what we do with it when it happens that matters and self-deceiving properties of the brain start kicking in. And before we know it, we can end up uh, thinking we're changing when we're really not. Yeah, that's, that's quite fascinating, actually. So how did you get involved with uh, CBS's uh, Face the Truth? Oh yeah, so there was a uh, that was a great opportunity of uh, I like the concept of the show by the way. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but it's a, uh, mm -hmm. a bunch of um, sort of different types of minds, you know, that are analyzing a situation, a legal, a, a coaching oriented, a, a clinical psych person. To, they're all kind of analyzing a situation and putting them, putting a, a guest all together, uh, or putting the the, the client's story or a guest story you know, right on the front of these experts and giving different opinions to it. So you don't just have sort of a one size fits all answer. It's really unique. And this is, I guess the show comes from Dr. Phil's exec and the doctor's executive producing team, which is kind of nice, but yeah, they just had a, a guest uh, that they needed uh, some aftercare work with that we were going to offer a complimentary service after they gave the intervention and they picked my company to do that. And they, they asked if I would be, you know, open to possibility of uh, doing more of that and so yeah it's been it's been a really nice opportunity um uh, to uh, be, be partnering with those guys no that's great man and congrats on that because that's that's a yeah. huge deal right yeah, so, that's nice. 
So walk me through how you actually work with people. From what I understand, you actually will physically go to somebody kind of basically wherever, right? Yeah, yeah. Right now, I mean, I mean, client-wise, we can be in, you know, five continents in one point. Uh, you know, but obviously, I have a, it's just mostly me that does a lot of the work. I have some associates that help with some of the other um, backside pieces. But um, yeah, so it, the engagement really obviously depends on the presenting issue. But um, most of the time, I'm old school, right? So I, I like, there's nothing better than a handshake and look in the eyes and get an assessment and get a, a good sort of intensive, we use the word intensive at Gray Matters, an intensive over three or four days so we can get um, a full workup, uh, assessment-wise, uh, marriage-wise, if they want me to get into the private life a little bit, or just on the corporate leadership piece or executive development, we can do a whole bunch of testing, interviewing, uh, facilitations, and then, for, and then even at times neuro, neurotechnology, some of the people that are really hurting that have some impulsivity issues or mood issues, we got some amazing tools from our side and we'll kick off as much change as we can within a, the shortest period of time. That's my whole model because attrition is a problem with this population. They're so busy. Uh, they may not show up again. And so you want to make sure that you're getting the brain, the mind, the body, the thinking sets to, to kind of shift as much as possible. And if you have to challenge, you challenge, you know, assuming readiness for the client, you're trying you're challenging hard right out of the gate uh, because you don't know how much you have. So, um, starts with that and then depending on the severity and the chronicity of the issue uh either just transition to just virtual support and all my all my coaching work is you know 24 7 access phone text email skype when they need it uh, which can be challenging for the international folks <laughs> challenging for me um uh, or you know if it's an ongoing thing uh, then maybe once a month we'll do a didactic a little skills camp a little boot camp kind of thing um, to keep the skill training and the coaching and the facilitation live kind of in the moment for them. Keep that going. And yeah, I will fly to locations so as they need me and plug in and build a plan for like six months if they need it or just the retreat on the front end. No, I think that's interesting, right? Because I think a lot of people want something that's tailored to them, like we kind of mentioned yeah. earlier in the show. And I think sometimes I'm, I'm guessing here and you can tell me your thoughts is yeah. like not every kind of treatment now needs a, a drug, right? Like there's lots of things you can do that maybe you need it, maybe you don't, but it seems to be like there's more of a movement to let's try some stuff before we just like, you know, give you some sort of prescription for something. Is that, is that fair to yeah. say? No, it's very fair. My, my web guys tell me uh, all the time, kind of give me my new data and how people find me. And it seems to be from a Google search term that gray matters is really coming up a lot with alternative as the word alternative minded kind of people that are looking for change. And of course you gotta screen out some folks that are more foo-foo with some of the stuff they're thinking about and wanting, but for the, but alternative's a really good word because it's really, a, it's really pointing to what else you got kind of a part of you, you know, it's like, what else you got behind the medical model? And like you said nicely, yeah, certain, you know, there are times when I have a partnering integrative psychiatrist that works with me and you're darn right, I, I keep that for a reason because there's just some cases I gotta make sure we've got covered from that angle. So this isn't either, this isn't an either or thing, a pro con kind of thing. It's more about how do we give these, these alternatives, these ways of creating brain change to people, how do we do this more frequently, more readily so people can get the help they need on this stuff and yeah, I mean, it, luckily this population has the means to, you know, to, to do that. Um, you know, down the road, my goal and desire is to kind of take some of these models and make it more into a kind of a third world kind of uh, environment to help, you know, trauma victims uh, who don't have those resources. So that's another passion of mine too. No, that's interesting, right? Because I, I think the, the thing that I've just kind of seen or read about anyway is some people fear getting addicted to something else, right? So you're just replacing one addiction with a different one, and that's sure, not really sure. better for anyone, really. Oh yeah, and I, 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 you know, I could probably preach on this one for a while, but I, I think the word addiction has been a blessing and a curse. Um, it's great that we're aware of the disorder, uh, but there's a bunch of people like myself. Um, um, Mark Lewis, this guy out in Amsterdam, has a wonderful book called Biology of Desire. And I'm, I'm kind of falling more in his camp over the years. Um, basically says, listen, biochemically, there's really not much of a difference between the process of falling in love and 
getting addicted to a chemical, there's a lot of out of, out of body experiences and desires and cravings that seem disproportionate to the stimuli itself. And um, when you get down to it, we may not have enough data to say it's an illness or disorder. It may be more broadly based and better treated if we look at this as a disorder desire kind of uh, process, which again, it's not let's just linguistic differences. I do think when you're looking at what it means for people, <laughs> you know, who want to get help but may not be ready to swallow that pill, I'm not. I'm not sure I call that denial all the time. I think sometimes that's a good, hold on, let's see what we got instead of that word. I think that's a good kind of place to start. Yes, it may be denial and readiness to change factor, but it also may be that we've got somebody really willing, but needs an alternative means of getting the brain to heal itself. Yeah, that's, that's actually really quite interesting. But we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about uh, you and any other maybe links you want to mention, maybe some social media links. Sure, no worries. Um, you can uh, definitely get the most info, in my opinion, from just my website, which is um, Gray Matters, I-N-T-L. And that's gray. We do the, we do the G-R-E-Y spelling. I love it. Uh, G-R-E-Y-M-A-T-T-E-R-S-I-N-T-L.com. And I'm very good... Um, responsively, I think, uh, if you want to reach out and email is always the best given the travel. So you can shoot me an email at Kevin at Kevin Fleming, PhD.com. And your last name is F L E M I N G. That's right. K E V I N at K E V I N F L E M I N G PhD.com. Perfect. Kevin. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time again to be on the show and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, right. too. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.